welcome to both of you again. It's great to have you here. My name is Ivo Mentens. I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner, and I also trained in the approach that we're going to see with uh, Dr. Howard Schubiner on the screen and Alan Gordon's pain reprocessing therapy. Howard, this um, maybe a first question. Um, your approach has evolved also over the last years. Uh, I can see in the training and also in the process working with people, there's like five main themes or steps. Yeah. Uh, the assessment of MBS, the neuroscience, yeah. education of it, provocative yeah. testing, pain reprocessing therapy, and yeah. emotional awareness and expression therapy. Could you just clarify this a bit for the participants? This, this, this whole area has been evolving over many years. I've been doing this for 20 years now. There's, a, there's trends. When I started the field of working in the field of chronic pain, what people said was all pain is the same. You shouldn't differentiate between one pain and another pain. We treat all pain the same. And that model is what we call the coping model. So it's like, well, you have chronic pain. We don't know why it's there. We can help you. We can't make it go away, but we'll help you cope with it as best we can. And that's been the standard model for a long time. And, and, and our model is different. Our model is, well, there are reasons. There has to be a reason for the pain. It's not like there's no reason or we can't understand the reason. Number one. Number two, we understand that from predictive processing and how the brain works, uh, that the brain is what creates pain. Number three, sometimes people have pain because they have ongoing tissue damage or injury in the body. But if you do a careful assessment and evaluation, which is what Evo was talking about, most of the time, it's quite easy to discern and understand that most people with chronic pain, and we've documented this in a couple of research studies and a new one that's just coming out now, that most of the time there is actually no damage in the body, which means that the pain is being generated by the brain. And research shows that stress and emotions and emotional issues and life stresses and adverse childhood events can all work together to activate the brain to cause pain and keep pain persistent for weeks, months, years, or even decades. And when that's the case, we believe that we've developed methods for helping people reverse that pain rather than simply try to cope with it as best as they can. And mm -hmm. so our model is completely different and I consider it to be revolutionary because Evo's old enough to remember the days back when we were thought we were going to change the world in the 1960s and 70s. Um, but this world of chronic pain needs changing. And the way it's being treated in, med in modern medicine is often um, it's inaccurately diagnosing people and it's often counterproductive. It's actually hurting people. Hmm. What would you say is then the big difference between uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and your approach? The difference is this difference between coping and curing. The coping model, the, the cognitive behavior, there's nothing wrong with cognitive behavioral therapy. The techniques are good. They're great. Uh, you know, it, it's not anything bad with it or wrong with it. It's just that it's when it, the way it's used, it's used in the context of not making an accurate diagnosis, not explaining how the brain works, not explaining that the body's not damaged and using it as coping rather than curing. So uh, that's the main difference. But for example, let's take pacing. There's a difference in how cognitive behavioral therapists would do pacing in terms, and what that means is basically if someone has pain with walking or pain with sitting, pacing would say, well, start small and don't do too much and then do a little bit more and a little bit more. But if you get pain, you should stop because pain means that you're doing too much. And our view of pacing is different. We don't call it pacing, but anyway, we call it graded exposure. And our view of that is that we're not trying to make the pain go away. We're trying to make the fear of pain go away. And when people mm -hmm. stop fearing the pain and people reinterpret the pain as a as a, an alarm signal, like a false alarm kind of thing, then they still need to do graded exposure, but they're actually not going to stop 
anytime they get pain or discomfort, they're going to keep going to the whatever degree they decided. If they're going to walk one block, they keep walking one block, but they keep reminding themselves that they're actually okay. So they're changing the neural circuits in the brain by walking rather than just accepting that the neural circuits aren't going to change. Hmm. that's that's the main difference hmm. I, I also had a question for uh kent what what struck you in the work of howard schubner how, how did you come to you know to make a documentary about it because it's it's quite an involvement yeah yeah maybe i should start um rewind a bit and talk about my own experience with chronic pain that that was my entry into it i had um when i was in college i had uh debilitating arm pain that was diagnosed as tendonitis and repetitive stress injury. And I saw many doctors, tried physical therapy. Uh, I also tried um, opioids and it was just, it got steadily worse and worse. Nothing was really working and I was really confused about it. And then I uh, stumbled across the work of a doctor at New York University named John Sarno. And I read his book called The Mind-Body Prescription. And in that book, um, the thing that really struck me was he just talks about how the body uh, has evolved to heal from injuries and that when injuries stick around, we shouldn't assume that it's because the damage just is still there and will never go away, which is what happens to so many people. You know, they'll have back pain for 10 years after a car wreck. And in my case, I, I'd only had it for eight months, but it seemed like it should have healed already. Um, it was from lifting weights at the gym. That's when I got injured. And uh, it made sense to me right away. And, and as I read the book and I started to do some of the writing exercises, the pain went away the next day. Um, I was starting to type on my computer and I was saying, you know, I know that my arm's not damaged. It's healed already. It's been eight months since the injury. Um, go away. And in that moment, the pain dissipated, um, which is a really eye opening experience. And I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I didn't know anything about this. And it seems kind of preposterous that physical pain has that quality. And then the pain moved to different parts of my body, to my shoulders, my chest um, over the next few months. And as I did the exercises John Sarno recommends, all those pains went away. But it was a really like educational experience about the mind-body connection. And it's, an, it's something I'll never forget. And, you know, it was about 10 years later, I thought, you know, that was an incredible experience. I'd gone to film school I wonder if anyone's ever made a film about that and no one had. So I called Dr. John Sarno, made in a, a schedule with him and it didn't work out to film with him. But his colleagues who I talked to were like, you know, you should talk to this person, Howard Schubiner. He's like John Sarno 2.0. He's adding mindfulness meditation. He's doing research studies. You know, he's really carrying this work on. And so I called Howard and um, we had a really nice chat the first time. It was just very easy rapport which was great. Um, and um, a few months later, um, I was flying out. It was just uh, me at first. Later on, um, uh, I began working with my, who became the co-director on the film, Marion Cunningham. We made the film together. Hi. Um, hello. My name is Joanna. Thank you so much for the work you do. Um, I've, I've experienced uh, the type of therapy that, that you're proposing, and I think it's it's changed my life. I mean, I, I think it's uh, it's incredible. So my question is, um, what type of research, clinical research, do you think is needed to uh, further this type of understanding of um, the mind and body relationship? And um, yeah, so what do you think would be uh, the right step forward in terms of clinical research? We need more research. <laughs> we are doing research. We have done research. Uh, we want to do as much as possible. I'm always excited to collaborate with anyone anywhere who wants to do research in this area. Um, there are tons of different types of studies that need to be done, uh, for, for sure. Uh, think, uh, the world changes in part by getting by having new data and new research. That's not the only thing that helps the world change, but it's an, a critical part of it. Uh, we on on the thismighthurtfilm.com website, there's a whole set of resources that include the research that we've done already. Uh, we um, um publishing a paper on in the next two weeks on called racism as a source of pain. Uh, we're finishing a paper now on a evaluation of 220 
people with chronic neck and back pain, determining how many of them have non-structural back pain? And the answer was 88%, which is very shocking to most, would be shocking to most regular orthopedic or neurosurgery doctors. Uh, we're starting a randomized controlled uh, trial on emotional awareness and expression therapy this year for back pain. Uh, Yoni Ashar is starting another pain reprocessing therapy trial in Denver this year. Uh, Brandon Yarns is starting a new research trial. So we, we, there's a lot of stuff that we're doing. Uh, we need uh, we need to branch out. What we need is some more research using this model in migraine, in fibromyalgia, in long COVID syndrome, particularly. Mike Danino at Harvard just is in the process of publishing a long COVID study, which was very exciting. So I, I, you know, we, we have the, we have the, we have the models of treatment uh, and we need to use those models in different arenas, I would say for different disorders. Now, I think that's the main focus I would suggest. I, I have another question uh, for you. Um, if this, if the results of this kind of work are so promising, as we saw in the documentary, and we also saw in the, the Boulder back pain study, why is it not more used? Why is this approach not more generalized in hospitals, to doctors, the medical science? Well, um, number one, it's not taught in medical school. Number two, it's not taught in residency. Number three, it's not taught in continu standard continuing education classes. You go to a standard continuing education education class for physicians on chronic pain, it teaches the old model, the one that I re uh, uh, referred to. It doesn't teach this model. Um, people are kind of behind the times on that from my point of view. Uh, it's hard to get people to change. Uh, and, you know, doctors don't necessarily uh, change easily or, or pick up on new things. Uh, and that's one problem. The, the second problem is, is that if a doctor starts to learn this and starts to tell patients about it, some patients will rebel, it will not be happy about it. So the doctor says, well, I think this is a stress-related illness. And the, and the patient says, oh, you're saying it's all in my head. You're saying I'm crazy. What's wrong with you? Don't you understand that my pain is real? and get mad at the doctor. And then the doctor's gonna say, well, I'm not doing that again. That didn't work out very well. For me, my patients hate me now. So <laughs> I, you know, that's, that's not good. That's not a good way to have a practice. So they, you know, they learn not to, you know, <laughs> uh, not to pursue this kind of model as well. You know, we're fighting, it's kind of, we're swimming upstream or out, climbing uphill in a lot of ways, because there's stigma against anything that's psychological. Uh, and there's misunderstanding of this. And, uh, and people are suffering, so many people are suffering. These problems, chronic pain, chronic pain, anxiety, depression, insomnia, and fatigue are the main causes of disability in the world. They're not the main causes of death. The main cause of death are cancer, stroke, heart disease, uh, chronic lung disease, but the main cause of disability are these. And so millions and millions of people are suffering and there are solutions for many of them, if not most of them. Um, but, you know, people have to find it on their own. The mm. People, have, you know, the people who really want this are the people who are suffering. Maybe a question for Kent uh, or for Howard both. Um, how did you go about the process of filming the sessions um, when you were having these conversations that were, for me, seemingly very intimate and private? How could you find a way to, you know, um, capture the moment without invading the privacy of the session or the, the people present? Yeah, I can talk about that. Um, this was uh, my first documentary, so I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes, but I think it really helped that um, I had been a chronic pain patient myself and I sat down with everybody in the class before filming started, before I turned cameras on and I told my story to them, why I wanted to make the film, um, what my motivation was. Um, and I think 
you know, I was surprised when I went back through the footage, it was rare that you saw people be obviously conscious of the camera. And I, I'm just speculating, but I think it's because people had chronic pain and they wanted to get, they wanted to unlearn their chronic pain and that's what they were focused on. And it, <laughs> they weren't letting the camera distract them and they could see the value of the work. And so I think they just were diving in. And I think I also, I think I was fortunate in the way that we, um, you know, talk to people beforehand that we, we were lucky to find people who were really open there. They were, and they hoped that their stories were going to be a benefit to other people. And so I think once me and them were really clear on that goal, then they kind of forgot about the camera um, for the most part. What do you think about the people working together? That was one of the questions here. Is that... Yeah, yeah, that, that was really interesting. I mean, that was one of the big challenges of making the film is so many people when we show, you know, we tell the story of them being in pain and then they show up to class and then they're doing therapy on each other. And so many people when we were showing early versions of the film, Rough Cuts, they were like, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> and so we had to go and re-interview Howard and explain, you know, why he works with people that way. Um, it was also important to just talk about, you know, why therapy hasn't worked before and how this therapy is different, um, because all the almost all the people in the film had been to psychotherapy before, and then suddenly they're finding help from non therapists in a therapeutic format. So it's a really unusual thing that you see. And I think um, uh, I think a big part of the healing process for for people who do peer therapy is is actually getting to see the reverse angle of their own problem, right? They're helping somebody else with chronic pain. And so they have to think about chronic pain differently. You know, like they're thinking, okay, what is this person's blocks? What's holding them down? What do they need to focus on? It sometimes that's an easier question to wrap your head around than what's holding me down? What are my blocks? What emotions do I not wanna face? But when you've helped someone else with that issue, then maybe you're able to take a look at your own problems from a different perspective. And as Tony, I don't think this line made it into the film, but at one point in Tony, he's talking about like, oh, I'm learning how to be my own doctor. You know, I'm learning how to, to heal myself. And so I think that was an important component of, of the peer therapy model. What's the name of your method? I was very mm -hmm. impressed by the stories in the movie and the changes made in such short time. The term intensive short time dynamic psychotherapy was mentioned. But you call it unlearning pain or? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you brought it up at the start, Evo. Uh, the, 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 the three main therapeutic components after the assessment and after the education about how the brain works and the fact that, they're, that people are actually not damaged. Uh, the three main uh, models we use, one is what we call pain reprocessing therapy, and that part of the, that wasn't highlighted quite as much in the film, uh, but uh, that part of it has to do with what we would call rewiring the neural circuits, helping people stop fearing the pain, stop focusing on it, uh, stop fighting it, stop being frustrated by it, and start to accept that it's there, but it's not dangerous, it can't harm you. And as you start to walk with joy or sit with joy or live your life with joy instead of with fear, the neural circuits get trained. Neurons that fire together, wire together. And we're literally retraining the neural circuits in the brain. That's the first component, pain reprocessing therapy. The second component is what we're now calling emotional awareness and expression therapy. And that we, Mark Lumley and I developed, and we learned that from Alan Abbas, who was one of the foremost teachers and researchers of intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy in the world. So EAET is a derivative of ISTDP, but it's a simpler version, or it's like ISTDP light. We sometimes call it for fun. And Alan Abbas and I work together. We've written a book together. Uh, and so the con a lot of the concepts on of EAET are taken from ISTDP. And these concepts have to do with allowing people to identify, express, and release powerful emotions that they may have been holding inside, such as anger, guilt, shame, fear, and grief, sadness, and helping people move through those emotions to compassion, self-care, and, um, and letting go. 
And then the final component is oftentimes changes in people's lives. So sometimes people need to make a change in their life. They may need to change their job or change a relationship or set boundaries or move or do something that they haven't been able to do that has been causing them excessive stress in their life, which is feeding that danger signal, which is continuing to produce pain or anxiety or depression or fatigue or insomnia or what, uh, whatever mind-body type condition they have. Thank you very much. On Zoom, a question. Could you speak to the transition from an actual injury to chronic pain in the same area once the injury has healed? Yeah, great question. Uh, what happens is the, the, the key thing to understand, which is mind-boggling and revolutionary, is that when you have an injury, it's not the injury causing pain. It's the brain causing pain. When you touch a hot stove, it's not your finger causing pain. It's actually the brain. And we know that because you can get an injury and not have any pain. Not all injuries lead to pain. This is well known. <clears throat> so when an injury occurs, the brain usually will turn on pain. It should. That's why the brain turns on pain to warn us that there's an actual injury and we should rest or get help or take care of it. Uh, so that's number one. Pain, pain due to an injury is actually created in the brain. Number two, the injury, the injury will heal. All injuries heal. Many, many people have been told that they have pain because they had a car accident a year ago or five years ago or 20 years ago. Or they have pain because they've had a, a fracture or a, a sprained ankle or whatever, or surgery. Uh, so all injuries heal. And once an injury heals, the brain can either turn off the pain, turn off that danger alarm mechanism, or have it continue. Why would the brain have pain continue after an injury is healed? Uh, it shouldn't, but it often does because if there's a lot of stress and emotional situation going on at the same time as the injury, and or there's tremendous fear or worry about the injury or about the pain, then the danger signal in the brain is more likely to be activated and the pain is more likely to persist for weeks, months, or years even after the injury is healed. So the mechanisms of that persistent pain have to do with neural circuits in the brain that are being uh, determined by stress, emotions, fear, et cetera. I maybe have a question that uh, comes back often also uh, working with uh, um, clients, working with patients, working with students, um, that the fact that uh, also Dr. Sauna says, yes, but the brain is protecting you with the chronic pain. Yeah, the clients will say, well, that's all well, but I don't need it. I don't need it. I want to get rid of it. So so how, how do you go about it, trying to explain them, to make them aware of the fact how this system works, how this mechanism works. It is really interesting. I was just talking about this uh, yesterday with, with somebody. Uh, it's, a, it's a man who has a migraine headache. And uh, he, he has migraine headache when it rains. Uh, other, other triggers to migraine headache are certain foods. Uh, and also if he has conflict or or uh, arguments at work or with his wife. So stress and, and, and certain triggers are triggering his migraine. And he was having uh, eight to 15 attacks of migraine every month. And I saw him yesterday and I've seen him twice. I had a first visit and a second visit. And now this was his third visit yesterday. And in the last month, he's only had one migraine. So dramatic drop in migraine from eight to 15 in one month to one per month in only uh, two months. And uh, he, when I first saw him, he said, uh, I said, well, when was your first migraine? He said, well, it occurred when I was around 19. And I said, well, where were you? What was going on? He says, well, nothing special. I was just in the car. Uh, nothing really was going on at all. It was not a stressful time. And I said, okay. And so we went on and, and I, I'm, I was teaching him how to stop 
having migraine when it rains, which was to, uh, <laughs> it sounds silly, but to start appreciating the rain, looking forward to rain instead of fearing rain, saying, oh, it's raining. Oh, good. This is a great time for me to calm my brain with the rain, go out in the rain, love the rain. I mean, it sounds silly, but if he can turn rain to being something joyful as opposed to rain being something fearful, his headaches will go away. And that's exactly what happened. He's stopped getting migraine with rain. It took him a few times to practice that, but he did it. Anyway, so I saw him the second visit and he said, you know, that very first migraine I had, I was in the car with my sister and she was telling me how disappointed my parents are were with me. They were disappointed in me because I had chosen a major in college or university that they didn't approve of. And that's when I got the first migraine. Right. He's like, unbelievable. He was like, his mind was blown. Oh my goodness. There's a reason for this. This migraine was a signal. It was a signal that there was something wrong, that there was stress, that there was emotion. There was something that was upsetting me. I had no idea that migraine is a signal. And we were talking about it. And, and, and I was explaining to him that once you figure this all out, the symptoms, the migraine or the back pain or the, or the stomach pain or the, whatever it is, is actually a gift. It's a way of brain protecting us, helping us, showing us, guiding us towards something. And now he can look at his life in a different way and he can help. He can help himself to deal better with conflict, to be kinder to himself, to stand up for himself, to think of himself in a different way, to deal with the underlying issues of how he, how he is and how, how, uh, how he treats himself. And that is a gift. But it's horrible to have debilitating migraines eight to 15 times per month, right? So right. and you're seeing it as my, you know, this is the worst thing ever. And it's horrible. And I'm not saying it isn't horrible. It is horrible. Mm. And then why would my brain be giving me this horrible thing? Mm. But now he understands my brain was giving it to teach me something. I just couldn't hear the message because my brain doesn't speak English or French. <laughs> <laughs> or Flemish or what, whatever languages you have over there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I, I, during the training also, and during the, also with uh, the training <laughs> sessions with Alan Gordon became clear. So you don't need to be a medical doctor to use this approach, but what would you think are the important skills or qualities for a practitioner in this field. Kent, what do you think? Yeah, because aren't you training to be a practitioner? Yeah, I am. I've, I uh, <laughs> began training to be a, a pain recovery coach. And it's a question I ask, you know, because I think, um, I think actually one of the a really good qualification that you're, I'm seeing a lot is that people are really skilled at helping other people when they've had chronic pain themselves, which is a the theme that's coming up here. And you'd see, I think about half of the doctors and therapists that have really focused on this work have had significant mind-body syndromes in their past that they were able to overcome using these methods, and now they want to help other people. So I'd say that it, it's not necessary. There's also, you know, easily half of people have not had significant mind-body syndromes, but um, it seems to help really grasp the concepts well and have like a deep embodied um, way of working with somebody and reassuring them that they're okay, they're not damaged, um, and that they're not blaming them or judging them because they've been in the exact same spot. Um, so I think, yeah, maybe being really compassionate um, and caring about other people's suffering is, is a huge one. Mm. Yeah, I mean, obviously the ability to relate the ability to understand, to listen, to be caring, the ability to, I mean, you know, like what we saw in the, in the movie, you know, you saw people helping other people. None of those people were therapists, trained as therapists, but they were take, able to take these concepts and, and help each other. So um, that's why, I mean, why am I teaching people who are Feldenkrais practitioners to do this work? Because they're amazing people. They work with people. They have skills. They've been probably a lot of them are doing this a long time. They know how to listen. They know how to interact with people. And, and a lot of the work they're doing is retraining people's brains already. So why not just, you know, amplify that a little bit? Mm. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other question that came up in the Zoom or in the chat for Evo? Ah, how does a somatic educational approach, such as the Feldenkrais method, fit in the picture of this process of healing chronic pain? And how did the work of Howard Schuler inform you in your teaching? Um, well, the Feldenkrais method is about enhancing abilities. It's about enhancing your uh, self-image, um, getting a better use of yourself. And you now getting this sense of getting better at something for people who are really stuck, for people who think sometimes there is zero, they have so many, so much pain is, uh, yeah, they can't move on. It's very empowering. The Feldenkrais method is about liking yourself more, about finding your autonomy again, being kinder to yourself. And this is also, these are very element, very important elements in the, uh, in the healing of chronic pain. Yeah. I, I, of course, these are all very abstract, I would say abstract ideas, uh, as abstract concepts, kindness or fear mechanisms or acceptance or um, comfort zone. But through movement in the Feldenkrais method, we can make these abstract concepts concrete. And we can make it really into an kinesthetic, internal sensorial experience, which is very different suddenly. They, it's not something somebody saying how to feel or what they could feel. You feel it on the inside. You, you hear all these internal conversations coming up. Hmm. Of course, we, we don't work with pain directly. We bring it into a larger context of uh, learning. And um, we, we, we're not interested in getting rid of something, but more to what's already there to make it better. And uh, we, we can even modulate this by creating successive approximations of learning, which is very empowering. It gives you a, a kind of grip, little by little, it gives you a grip on your life again. And that's, that's very powerful. Uh, but to sense clearly again without fear, uh, I would say. Now, what did, what did I get from this method, from the work of Howard? Um, I would say it revolutionized completely my thinking about the origin, the development, and the healing of uh, chronic pain. It gave me simple evidence-based uh, tools that I could use in my daily practice, but also for the, I would say, the healing of myself uh, through life. Mm. A, a colleague of mine said uh, a while ago, chronic pain is like a hot potato. Uh, everybody's passing it on to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about it. And now I think, yes, I can talk about it. And moreover, I have uh, concrete tools to enhance this guided learning process with my uh, clients. So, yeah, thank you very much for uh, what I learned through this, uh, through this work. I, I hope this answered the questions a little bit. I mean, I, <laughs> if you want to know more about it, I, I gave a conference about this uh the relationship between how it's work and the feldenkrais method you can find it on the website of feldenkrais education where i go further in depth about this so there's another question for howard schubiner how is it possible to heal these inner traumas in a few weeks sometimes it needs big fundamental changes in our lives these do not happen in a few weeks or in a few weeks most of the time yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's, uh, I was just talking about this today with Mark Lemley, actually. There's trends within the world of trauma. And, you know, on one hand, there's people who say, well, you can grow from trauma. There's something called, called post-traumatic growth. 
On the other hand, there's people who say you never get over trauma or it'll take 20 years to deal with your trauma. And to approach the trauma, you have to approach the trauma very, very carefully because we don't want to trigger people into uh, relapses. And other people say, well, if we never approach the trauma, how are we going to help people heal from it? So there's all this spectrum out there and we're trying to take a middle approach. Uh, what we're trying to say is that we, we need to be compassionate and caring and loving and uh, understanding of people, what they've been through. I've seen people who've had just unspeakable levels of trauma in their life, uh, unspeakable. Uh, <laughs> and yet, if we are... Uh, if we are loving and careful and cautious, but also have enough uh, uh, courage and confidence to begin to address it, it's it's doable. And it doesn't mean that the whole thing, all of it is addressed in a short time. Of course it's not. But if you begin to address it, you begin to uh, peel away, so I'm talking about peeling away the onion, you begin to address some of the emotions that are there, oftentimes the pain will go away in a short time. The symptoms can get better relatively quickly. It doesn't mean all the trauma is healed. And over time, people can continue to work on trauma. Sometimes the work we do makes helps the pain or the anxiety or depression or fatigue go away relatively quickly. But it's the longer work of dealing with um, more of the stresses, emotions, trauma that can help to keep it away, if that makes sense. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question through Zoom. But when you are not a doctor, how can you know whether the pain is linked to a real damage or not? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, people think that uh, only doctors can uh, and figure this out. Sometimes doctors can't figure it out because doctors don't understand it. I, in my book, Unlearn Your Pain, and in the workshops I do, I teach people how to determine if it's structural or not. And it's actually not that hard most of the time. I was talking about this today with, uh, I was talking to Abigail Hirsch, Ken. And, um, and I was saying that when people have chronic knee or hip or shoulder pain, uh, oftentimes you need a doctor to help sort that out. Uh, but if someone has fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, migraine headaches, chronic pelvic pain, back pain, those are usually easy to figure out. I was talking to a doctor the other day and she had hand pain and somebody asked about repetitive strain injury on the on the chat. And she had uh, hand pain and went to the other, kind of like what Ken had, hand pain in one hand, went to the other hand, went to the arm, went to the other arm, whole arm, both arm, went on and on and on. And she had to stop working as a doctor. She had to quit practicing as a doctor because she had all this pain. And as a doctor, she had no idea why she had this pain. And the doctor she went to and the physical therapist she went to had no idea, couldn't tell her why she had this pain because her exam was normal. Her hands looked normal. Her exam was normal, muscles work, nerve works, et cetera, right? And she told me, she said, you know, it was funny that uh, after two or three years of pain, I went away, I went away on vacation for a week. And for that week, the pain completely disappeared. And then it came back when I came back to work. Okay. Did any of her doctors listen to that or ask about that or pay attention to that? But if you know this, what I just, what happened to her, if you know that if the pain goes away when you're on vacation and comes back when you come back, that means it's mind-body pain. That's all you need to know. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't have to be a doctor to know that. And there's about 20 of those different clues that I have, that I've written about, that I teach, that are easy to identify. And that's why a lot of this work, Kent, Kent, Kent's pain got better, not because he saw a doctor. It's because he read a book and the book described exactly what he had. And when he saw that the book described exactly what he had, he knew that what he had was a neural circuit problem or a mind body problem. He knew it. He didn't take, and he wasn't a doctor. <laughs> 
Okay, so it's not that hard actually for most mm-hmm. of the time. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so, what do you do when you can't identify any clear emotional or psychological problem in a chronic pain patient? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, most of the time, you can identify a pattern. For example, somebody may have, like, let's say they started having uh, back pain a year ago. And you ask about what happened a year ago, and there's nothing in particular that they can point to, we, we can't find. But when you go back and look at their life, and you see that they had uh, headaches when they were a child, or an eating disorder as a teen, or anxiety in their 20s, or depression in their 30s, you begin to see the patterns, and you can begin to see the emotional situations that cause the other situations earlier in their life. And that will become a clue. And that is something that you can work on with them. Number one. Number two, if there's no particular ongoing emotional issue currently happening at the time, then you don't have to worry about that. You can use the pain reprocessing therapy techniques, which are to rewire the circuits in the brain. You don't necessarily have to deal with deep emotional issues to help people get out of their pain. Kent got out of his pain, not by dealing with deep emotional issues, but by understanding that his pain was caused by his brain and not his body. And so if you understand that, and as Feldenkrais practitioners, if you help people to uh, calm their nervous system, if you help people to align their bodies, if you help people to feel comfortable in their bodies and I don't know, what else do you do, Eva? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> if you help people do that, if you help people move with confidence, right? If you help people feel comfortable in their body and knowing that their body's not damaged or broken, what a great, what a great way to help people heal when you add the knowledge that what we're saying is if you can help them understand that, guess what? They're not actually damaged or broken physically. That is a powerful combination. Mm. Thanks, Art. Here's a great question. Are there successful results with a patient with amnesia suffering from chronic pain? There are several case, there are several case studies that I've read about where people had chronic pain and they developed some amnesia. They developed some forgetfulness and they forgot their pain. Their pain went away. Or they they had chronic pain and they went into, they got sick with a serious illness and went into intensive care unit. When they came out of the intensive care unit, the pain was gone. Uh, there's several, uh, several things like that. If someone, if someone can't remember their trauma, for example, that may be what the question is getting at. I'm not in the business of trying to uncover repressed memories or find memories that aren't there or whatever. It's, you know, if people, Whatever people remember, they remember. Whatever they don't remember, they don't remember. But when you work on, it's my feeling that when you work on an emotional issue for something that's happening right now in in your present life, you're actually also working on an emotional issue that happened in your past because the brain remembers. Your brain remembers the prior traumas even if you don't remember them. It's the difference between explicit and implicit memory. Implicit memory is the subconscious memory that we may not be able to recall, uh, you know, consciously. So dealing with whatever emotions and emotional issues are going on in one's life and ones they can remember, in my opinion, are enough. You don't have to uncover and find trauma or, or like, for example, you know, go through birth trauma or try to find trauma that happened in your parents' life or your grandparents' life, things like that. I don't believe you have to do that. On the other hand, I will say one thing that just struck me. I have a patient who had a rageaholic father, a very, very abusive, violent father. And this patient has severe depression, severe pain, dissociation episodes, all sorts of very severe symptoms. And we worked a lot on dealing with the issues of the of the anger with his father, the anger he had toward his father. He was having these suicidal nightmares and homicidal nightmares, a lot of violent things going on. And one of the things he did as part of our therapy, he in his imagination, he went back and visited his father 
when his father was a child. And he saw his father, or imagine, of course, you know, but he saw his father as a child when his father's mother died, when his father's father married another woman who happened to be very mean and abusive to him. And it helped him to become way more compassionate toward his father. And that helped his healing process. And it was a very beautiful and poignant uh, episode. Mm. Uh, can you talk about how the training in April will be organized? What will you do during the training? I have set out the whole syllabus. The first day we're going to focus on um, uh, neuroscience and how the brain works and learning all about predictive processing and how to talk to people about the brain and predictive processing. The second day, we're going to talk about diagnosis and assessment and how to assess people, just what we were talking about earlier. The third day, we're going to talk about pain, not only talk about, but do and, and demonstrate and practice all these things. Third day is on pain reprocessing therapy, how to re rewire the neural circuits. The fourth day is on emotional awareness and expression therapy, how to help people cope with emotional issues. And a lot of these techniques are very simple and don't require therapy or, or uh, a lot of the stuff you saw in the film. And the fifth day, uh, we're going to focus on uh, life events, life changes. And uh, I think we're going to have a big party, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Someone says, what do, you, what do you say when the patient says it's all in my head? There you go. And uh, the answer is, I know, you know, that this pain is real. And I know that this pain is real. Anybody who says it's all in your head is, is either um, being uninformed or, or dismissive or judgmental or downright cruel or mean. Because it's not all in your head. All in your head is this is the, the 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 worst thing someone can say to you. I'm not saying that. I know this pain or this symptom, this fatigue or depression or anxiety is real. The question is what's causing it. And real pain, real symptoms can be caused by neural circuits in the brain. That's different than being all in your head. This is real. And I've had these kinds of pain. I've, and I've seen hundreds of people with this kind of pain that's real. And there's hope for people with this kind of pain. This kind of pain can be reversed. And so that's that's one way that I try to, you're, you're just trying to do this with love, you know, with compassion. And that's the whole thing. And if someone, and if that doesn't make sense to somebody, then then they don't have to, uh, you know, they don't have to go down this path. You know, if it doesn't make sense to them, and if it's not right for them, then that's that's up to them. Uh, mm. So, you know, we never, we're not trying to force this on somebody or sell this to somebody. We're just presenting information that can be helpful. The idea of this is not to tell people that the pain is due to a neural circuit, but to show them, demonstrate to them by our techniques that I'm going to be teaching you that are all in our, in our work. All right. Thank you, Howard, for this uh, session. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Kent, for being with us. A few reminders. If you would like to know more about the training in April with Howard Schubner, you can download a PDF on the website with the full syllabus and all the practical information that you want to know. The website of Feldenkrais Education or the Forest Lighthouse website. If you want to know more about the Feldenkrais trainings in Belgium and France, you can also go to the website of Feldenkrais Education, of course. For the moment, we started new trainings with uh, Educational Director Alan Costell, who is here tonight as well. Thank you very much, everybody on Zoom. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Kent. And thank everybody in the space here. And um, I'm looking forward to meet you guys again. And yes. please thank, thank Kent for making this movie, him and Marion. You know, it was a labor of love. They did an amazing job. Uh, if you know anybody who, uh, you know, wants to see the film or be involved in it, please write to them. Uh, if you want to donate money to them, please donate money to them on their website. 
because they're they're still in debt from making the film and um, they're just trying to promote it and, and get this message out there to people. So thank you, Kent. Thanks again. Thank you. We will spread the word, Kent. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.